Ah, welcome back once again. This is the Moon of Israel, Solonomics 101, the Lev Project. You know, I cannot forget the Lev Project. It's just taking on a little life of its own. You know, it's um going in so many different directions, but it's the same direction at the same time, if you can understand what I'm saying. Sorry for the strange time of the day, but the day is all compacted. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know what? Better get it on here. And thank you for those who tune in after it's already gone out. Um, and that's very much appreciated. And so I understand if you can't do it live and um, hopefully we can get, we've got a lot of conversation around the underground reviews of the show that's on WGN and it's happening every week. I think we're on going on to the sixth episode now. Um, and we're taking a look at what it is that we're learning on the left project with the narratives and analyzing it. So it's more than just uh, entertainment. It has become kind of like homework. And so we've been getting a lot of feedback from that. It's a beautiful thing. And I want to thank you. So this is what started it all. Just the desire to share what I was reading as it related to slavery, as it related to what I was discovering. And, um, and so this is where we are. We can't forget the route, the foundation and the roots. I'm going to go ahead and start now. It is what's today, the 11th. But I'm just realizing that it is a uh, child abuse awareness month and we had women's history month last month and we were reading the, this, the narratives or short narratives of female slaves out of the book, this book, <laughs> out of this book. We were reading out of this book, Weevils in the Week, right? And we, we halfway there as it related to, you see where my marker is? Yeah, so that we're halfway there as it related to female narratives. And being that this institution affected women, men, children, black, white, everyone, it's good to get an all around a panoramic view um, of what they're experiencing at night. Again, my nights are just so sporadic. Again, for those who want to read, just, just holler at me. And for those, these ones that are actually PDF or on the internet, you're welcome to join the Lev Project and read it. So it's not just when I can make it, you know, um, we'll have other people who can raise their voices as well. But in the meantime, I'll keep holding it down. I'll keep holding it down. Uh, before that, the month before that was so-called Black History Month, and we were reading different different uh, narratives. And so here we are in the fourth month of the Lev Project, and uh, it's child abuse awareness. I want to give a shout out to my one of my elders, Ima Alishaba, when she saw me really going in on these uh, projects and these narratives. One day I went to my mailbox and I saw a big box. It was heavy too. You know, and I'm like, what's this? And I saw her name. She's always sending goodies. Shout out to Ima Alishaba. And I'm like, what's this? And when we opened it up, it's like all of these different narratives. And I was kind of excited. I mean, you know, the babies are like, why are you jumping? I'm like, wow. So needless to say, I have a lot to read and I invite others to read as well. And we can book report and share what we've learned so that we can kind of put this uh, piece together of the puzzle. But one of the books that was in there was this book, Growing Up in Slavery. As you see, I have my daughter's name on here. But when I started reading it, I'm like, nah, this is a little bit too grown up for children. Um, some of the other ones were a little more adapted to children but i could you know imagine that children didn't have that censorship there was no pg 13 there was no uh, rated g you know i when you're really thinking about it children and slavery was exposed to rated r or triple x movies which was their reality that's their real life and i'm realizing this as i'm like wow this is the, my daughter's eight and i'm like wow this is too harsh but this is true life this is not adapted um stories some of the other stories that we got is like adapted stories um taking real life things and, and making it more fictional but this is non-fiction it's stories of young slaves as told by themselves so what they did was they went through the narratives and they got the portion where the person was speaking about their childhood and then they put it in the book growing up in slavery 
what was I going to say? I was going to say, we're still working on, look, I got all the books by the computer. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, we're getting through it. We're still working on this at night, 30 Years a Slave by Lewis Hughes. So we're still working on that at night. And so we're kind of juggling it here. Um, we're getting the essence out of it. Some of them are short narratives. These are a compilation of short narratives. And so we're going to read about, it says in this book, 10 slaves tell in their own words what it was like to grow up in slavery. They range from Oladu Equiano, Frederick Douglass, William Wells Brown, Harriet Jacobs, Elizabeth Kickley, who would later become famous to others whose narratives have long been forgotten and we know that the narratives has long been forgotten and so we're going to go into them it says each of these stories is taken from the slaves own books each one shows a young african-american or under the age of 19 trying to deal with unbelievably difficult circumstances being torn from mother and family not getting enough to eat being constantly watched being whipped and even tortured but these are not all tales of deprivation and violence, these slaves overcame tremendous obstacles to learn to read and write, and they tell how. They challenge authority in many ways from trickery to outright rebellion, and they did the things that we all do, from playing games to telling jokes to falling in love. And in reading their tales, you'll see exactly what it was like to be a slave from the passage in a slave ship across the Atlantic to daily life, both on large plantations and in a small city, homes, to escaping slavery and even fighting in the Civil War. So that's the opening of the book. The first person on the list within this book, and they mix it up between male and female, young children. This is them in their own voice. Um, and so we're gonna read. If you don't have this book, it's very interesting. I, I, Again, the name of the book is Growing Up in Slavery. Why? Because this is one of the most horrendous experiences of child abuse. You want to talk about Child Abuse Awareness Month? You need Child Abuse Awareness Millennia. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Centuries of slave sanctioned child abuse. It's funny. I don't want to go off on a tangent, so I'm just going to start reading. But what I find funny is that these things need to be called into account. These things need to be remembered because those who say they're advocating now for child abuse and child awareness, their four parents were the perpetrators. They were the progenitors of how to abuse a child and leave it on record. You understand? I'm just gonna keep reading because if we don't have these conversations and oftentimes people are running to the very same people who perfected the art of oppression and perfected, and it's not to say, oh, I'm gonna be mad, I'm gonna be angry. No, it's just gonna be aware so that we are aware when we're having this conversation that we're not um, jaded in our remembrance. Let me just say that. Ola do, and ola da, hopefully I'm saying this name right. La da Equiano, or Gustavos Vasa. By the end of his life, Olada Equiano, aka Gustavas Vasa, 1745 to 1797, seemed to have accomplished practically everything that it was possible for a black man to accomplish in his time. If we can believe everything he tells us in his brilliantly autobi autobiographical autobiography, and I have the book too, I haven't read it yet. The interesting narrative of the life of Olado, or Olada Equiano, or Gustavas Vasa, the African, 1789. Equiano grew up in the remotest Africa, was sold as a slave and was transported across the Atlantic in a slave ship, was cheated out of his freedom by an unscrupulous master, witnessed the worst aspect of slavery in the West Indies, made close friends with whites of both sexes, became a successful businessman, managed a slave estate, saved the crew of a shipwreck, captained a ship, officiated as a pastor at a funeral, made war in Canada and in the Mediterranean, went on a voyage to North Pole, worked as a hairdresser. Okay, I'm gonna have to read his <laughs> became an accomplished French horn player, 
stayed with Turks in Sumeria and Mosquito Indians in Central America, was employed by British government to help resettle free blacks in Africa, wrote letters, poetry, memoirs, cut a handsome figure in super fine clothes, quote unquote, gave evidence before a British parliamentary committee on the slave trade, petitioned the queen for abolition, knew many of the most famous people of his day and was visited by the Lord himself. His book was the most famous and influential black autobiography of its time. Equiano, who was known by his slave name Gustavus Vasa throughout his life was rightly been called the father of African-American autobiography. And while his page ranges in more than one sense all over the map, it is masterfully written in, in writing. Equiano did more than any other black man before Frederick Douglass to stir anti-slavery sentiment. For those who just joined us, I'm reading, let me finish and then I'm gonna tell you where I'm reading from. It became the most popular book ever written by a black author up until that point, selling about 20,000 copies. People don't sell 20,000 copies today. Can I sell 20,000 copies? <laughs> and in 22 editions over 50 years, below are Equiano's account of his kidnapping from the home of his parents, probably in present day Nigeria, his horrific voyage on a slave ship, the most detailed firsthand account we have from a slave point of view, and his arrival in the new world. It may prove to be somewhat more difficult to read than the narratives that follow it, for not only does it substantially pre predate them, but it was written for a more educated audience and by a more educated man. Uh, like I was saying earlier, for those who may have missed, in light of it being Child Abuse Awareness Month, last month was Women's History Month, so we read the female narratives, and now it's Child Abuse Awareness Month, so we're reading Growing Up in Slavery. These are the narratives of, these are the portions. It's 10 different narratives. So we'll read it hopefully throughout the month. And um, right now we're gonna read uh, Mr. Equiano, Elada, Elada Equiano. And it's the portion of his narrative that describes his childhood. And we're really bringing awareness or shedding light on, like I said before, you guys may have joined us, one of the most abusive systems to children, men, women, and everybody in between. Um, and this is him sharing his experience as a child. His being kidnapped with his sister. He says, my father, besides many slaves, had a numerous family of which seven lived to grow up, including myself and a sister who was the only daughter. As I was the youngest of the sons, I became, of course, the greatest favorite with my mother and was always with her. And she used to take particular pains and form my, to form my mind. I was trained up from my early years in the art of war. My daily exercise was shooting and throwing javelins. And my mother adorned me with emblems after the manner of our greatest warriors. In this way, I grew up till I was turned the age of 11, when an end was put to my happiness in the following manner. Generally, when the grown people in the neighborhood were gone far in the fields of labor, the children assembled together in some of the neighbor's premises to play. And commonly, some of us used to get up a tree to look out for any assailant or kidnapper that might come upon us. For they sometimes took those opportunities of our parents' absence to attract or to attack and carry off as many as they could seize. One day, as I was watching at the top of a tree in our yard, I saw one of those people come into the yard of our neighbor, but of our next neighbor, but one to kidnap there being many stout young people in it. Immediately on this, I gave the alarm of the rogue and he was surrounded by the stoutest of them who entangled him with cords so that he could not escape till some of the grown people came and secured him. But alas, ere long, it was my fate to be thus attacked and be carried off when none of the grown people were nigh. And that's interesting to note, but that by this time in the 1700s, they were aware of what they called man stealers and they had to have whole, like he's saying, a whole elaborate um, communication network to alert one another when one of these man stealers were around. But he says, regardless of that, the man stealers got him. One day when all our people were going out to their works as usual, and only I and my dear sister were left to mind the house, two men and a woman got over our walls and in a moment seized us both and without giving us time to cry out, or make resistance, they stopped our mouths and ran off with us into the nearest woods. Here they tied our hands and continued to carry us as far as they could till night came when we reached a small house where the robbers halted for refreshment and spend the night. 
we were then unbound, but were unable to take any food and being quite overpowered by fatigue and grief, our only relief was some sleep, which allayed our misfortune for a short time. The next morning we left the house and continued traveling all the day. For a long time we had kept the woods, but as last we came into a road, which I believe I knew. I had now some hopes of being delivered, for we had advanced but a little way before I discovered some people at a distance of which I began to cry out for their assistance. But my cries had no other effect than to make them tie me faster, more firmly, and stop my mouth. And then they put me in a large sack. They also stopped my sister's mouth and tied her hands, and in this manner we proceeded till we were out of the sight of these people. When we went to rest, the following night they offered us some victuals, but we refused it. And the only comfort we had was in being one another's arms all, the, all that night and bathing each other with our tears. But alas, we were soon deprived of even the small comfort of weeping together. The next day proved a day of great sorrow than I had ever experienced for my sister and I were separated. While we lay clasped in each other's arms, it was in vain that we besought them not to part us. She was torn from me and immediately carried away while I was left in a state of distraction not to be described. I cried and grieved continually and for several days I did not eat anything but what they forced into my mouth. Because as we read before, they force they force you to eat because you're not any good to them until they get you to where they can sell you. And so if he dies along the way, that to them that's cargo that didn't, you know, didn't actualize monetarily. And so they're forcing him to eat, not really because they care. It says the effect the sight of a slave ship had on him. The first object which saluted my eyes when I arrived on the coast was the sea and a slave ship, which was then riding at anchor and waiting for its cargo. These filled me with astonishment, which was soon converted into terror when I was carried on board. I was immediately handled. He was a boy. Remember, he's like 11 now, 11 year old which was, he said, I was immediately handled and tossed up to see if I was sound by some of the crew. And I was now persuaded that I had gotten into a world of bad spirits and that they were going to kill him. Their complexion too differing so much from ours, their long hair and the language they spoke, which was very different from any I had ever heard. Hold on one second. I got a wandering baby. <laughs> Hold on for me one second. All right. I know y'all saw the wandering baby. My daughter, she's just like, I don't want to take a nap. I'm going to wander around. But I don't like when they hear, not so young to hear some of this stuff. Um, he says their complexions, I read that. And united to conform me in, in this belief. Indeed, such were the horrors of my views and fears at the moment that if 10,000 worlds had been mine, own, I would have freely parted with them to have exchanged my condition with that of the meanest slave in my own country. When I looked around the ship too, and I saw a large furnace of copper cooking pot boiling and a multitude of black people of every description chained together, every one of their countenances expressing dejection and sorry, sorrow. I no longer doubted of my fate and quite overpowered with horror and anguish, I fell motionless on the deck and fainted. So he's looking at again. We all we already know, uh, and if we from what we've been reading or what we've learned before, there's different tribes represented. There's all not one tribe. So he's seeing people from all different tribes um, represented, and he's looking at their faces like this is this is crazy. And so he faints. He says, "When I recovered a little, I found some black people about me who I believe were some of those who bought me on board, because Africans were involved." and had been received their pay. They talked to me in order to cheer me, but all in vain. I asked them if we were not to be eaten by those white men with horrible looks, red faces and loose hair. They told me I was not. So he was afraid that these men were cannibals. He says, um, 
They told me I was not, and one of the crew brought me a small portion of spiritous or alcoholic liquor in a wine glass, but being afraid of him, I would not take it out of his hand. One of the blacks therefore took it from him and gave it to me, and I took a little down my palate, which instead of reviving me as they thought it would, threw me into the greatest consternation at the strange feeling it produced, having never tasted any such liquor before. Soon after this, the blacks who brought me on board went off and left me abandoned to despair. I now saw myself deprived of all chance of returning to my native country, or even the least glimpse of how of hope of gaining the shore, which are now considered as friendly, and I even wish for my former slavery in preference to my present situation, which was filled with horrors of every kind, still heightened by my ignorance of what I was to undergo. And, so, and a, lot of, a lot of people had no idea what was before them. Um, it says, soon after this, the blacks who brought me, okay, sorry, I was not long suffered allowed to indulge myself, my grief. I was soon put down under the deck and there I received such a salutation, welcome in my nose as I had never experienced in my life. So that with that, the loathsomeness of the stench and crying together, I became so sick and low that I was not able to eat, nor had I the least desire to taste anything. I think it was, what did we read? Was it Alexander Falconbridge? It was one of the European, I think he was a surgeon. We read that earlier, maybe in January, and he was speaking about, it was a European, I can't remember, it's Alexander Falconbridge or another one, John, John Barlow, I think, one of the two. And they were speaking about the condition, how he couldn't be down under the ball of the ship for 15 minutes because the stench, the fact that, you remember that one? The fact that they couldn't make it to the bathroom, there was feces, there was, there was bile, there was throw up, there was everything imaginable in that environment. It was sickly. Um, and so the young boy, 11 years old, is saying he went down there and he was sick um, to his stomach. He says, I now wish for the last friend, death, to relieve him. But soon to his grief, two of the white men offered eatables and on my refusing to eat, one of them held me fast by his hand and laid me across, I think the windlass, a barrel around which a rope was tied used to hoist the anchor and tied my feet while the other flogged me severely. Because not only did the capturers need you to eat and the slave ship needs you to eat because they need to get their money now. Because remember it's business. So they need to get the goods, the cargo, to the islands or to the Americas so that, and then I think in this particular place, he's going to the islands so that they can get their money. And so you not eating is damaging the goods, right? So they beat him. I had never experienced anything of this kind before. Remember he's 11. And although not being used to the water, I naturally feared that element the first time I saw it. Nevertheless, could I have got over the nettings placed alongside of the ships to prevent slaves from jumping overboard. And we read that before, that they put uh, these netting things to kind of deter you from taking your own life and by extension, they're not being able to cash in on you. I would have jumped over the side, but I could not. And besides the crew used to watch us very closely who were not chained down to the decks, lest we should leap into the water. And also remember we were reading when they were speaking about how some jumped over the ships and the sharks were there and they literally, the sharks would literally jump up and bite the people. And one of them was testifying to actually seeing somebody broken in half. I'm over here just talking. Let me, let me make sure I'm not missing anybody's uh, conversation here. One second. Um, uh, okay. As you know, always you can comment on the side. Let me pull this up so I can see the comments so I won't miss them. Let me see here. We're probably gonna take, okay. All right. So, all right, we're good. So it says, in a little time after, Amongst the poor chained men, I found some of my own nation. And this is what I always say, side note, it was more than one people represented on the slave ship. 
And people were like, oh, we were all black. They didn't think so. <laughs> you know, he said he found one of his own nation. Of all these people, he found somebody that he could relate with because there were so many different tribes or nations represented there that they didn't see themselves as the same person. How much so, even though we would want everybody to say we shall overcome, kumbaya, it doesn't happen. And I think it doesn't happen because we're not. Uh, I greet this angel. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I think oftentimes we're not taking this into consideration um, that everybody wasn't the same people. He says, in a little time after amongst the poor chained men, I found some of my own nation, which in a small degree gave me ease to my mind. I inquired of these what was to be done with us. They gave me to understand we were to be carried to these white people's country to work for them. I then was a little revived and thought it, if it were not no worse than working, my situation was not so desperate, but still I feared I should be put to death. The white people looked and acted as I thought in so savage a manner. So they're saying, you know, there was the Europeans are like, oh, you know, these black people, these Africans, they're savage. And <laughs> those who are captured, it's not funny. They're looking like, no, you the savage one, look at you, you know, and it's, it's just interesting. He said, in so savage a manner, for I had never seen among any people such instances of brutal cruelty. Like I said, Child Abuse Awareness Month, this is the, the voice of an 11-year-old recounting the story of what he's seeing at this age. And this not only shown towards us Blacks, but also to some of the whites themselves. And we heard that from Falcon Bridge complaining about how the captains of the ships abused uh, the lower rankings, the sailors of the ships. We heard, you know, they took away their food, they would beat them, and the sailors wanted to run away. So he's also collaborating that story. Not the same ship, but the way in which they treated one another. It says, one white man in particular I saw when we were permitted to be on deck, flogged so unmercifully with a large rope near the foremast that he died in the consequence of it, and they tossed him over the side as they would have done a brute. This man made me fear these people the more, and I expected nothing less than to be treated in the same manner. Brutal, physical, brute force, abuse, terrorism, uh, yeah. I could not help expressing my fears and apprehension to some of my countrymen. I asked them if these people had no country, but lived in the hollow place, the ship. They told me they did not, but came from a distant one. Then said I, how comes in all our country we never heard of them? They told me because they lived so very far off. I, I then asked, where were their women? Had they any like themselves? I was told they had, and why, said I, do we not see them? So he's like, don't they have a life? Don't they have, you know, don't they have a land? You know what I'm saying? Why are they here? And basically, you know, in the mind of a, a child trying to understand, I could hear the conversation like, okay, I came from a place you had mom, you had dad, you had male, female children. Okay, I only see the men and they're really cruel and brutal. Like where are the rest of the people and do they have a land? And if so, what are they doing here? He says, um. Hold on one second, please. Okay, I'll deal with that in a minute. So he says, um, they told me because they live so very far off. I asked where were their women and they had, had they any like themselves? I had, I was told they had, and why said I, don't we not see them? They answered because they were left behind. I asked how the vessel could go. They told me they could not tell, but that there were cloths put up upon the mass by the help of ropes I saw. And then the vessel went on and the white men had some spell or magic they put in the water when they liked in order to stop the vessel. So they're trying to figure out in their understanding of, of, of what they've been used to. You know, how are they getting this thing to move? You know, And so they're going into beginning to try to explain that. He says, I was exceedingly amazed at this account and really thought they were spirits. I therefore wished much to be from amongst them for I expected they would sacrifice me, but my wishes were vain for we were so quartered that it was impossible for any of us to make our escape. And remember they were below the ship in tight quarters, um, tied oftentimes tied down and things of that nature. While we stayed on the coast, I was mostly on deck. And one day to my great astonishment, I saw one of the vessels coming in with the sails up. 
As soon as the whites saw it, they gave a great shout, at which we were amazed, and the more so as the vessel appeared larger by approaching nearer. At last she came to an anchor in my sight, and when the anchor was let go, I and my countrymen who saw it were lost in astonishment to observe the vessel stop, and were now convinced it was done by magic. But of course, we know the anchor is the big iron thing that's going to weigh down the ship and not allow it to move. Soon after this, the, the other ship got her boats out, and they came on board of us, and the people of the both ships seemed very glad to see each other. Several of the strangers also shook hands with us black people and made motions with their hands, signifying, I suppose we were to go to their country, but we did not understand them. So you, I, I don't even want to just say imagine. You can, you can just imagine. Um, we might have to split Oladu up in two, but I'm going to read Horos of a Shave Ship. He says, at last, when the ship when the ship we were in had got in all her cargo, they made ready with many fearful noises, and we were all put on the deck so that we could not see how they managed the vessel. But this disappointment was least of my sorrow. The stench of the hole while we were on the coast was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time. And some of us had been permitted to stay on the deck for the fresh air. But now that the whole ship cargo were confined together, it became absolutely pestilential. <laughs> like we ought to go on. He said pestilential. He says deadly. The closeness of the space and the heat of the climate added to the number on the ship, which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocated us. The produced copious perspiration so that the air soon became unfit for respiration or breathing from a variety of loathsome smells and, and brought on a sickness among the slaves of which many died, and they called it flux, remember? Thus failing or fall, falling victim to the improvident, short-sighted avarice, as I may call it, of their purchasers. Like, they wasn't really concerned, you know? It's like whatever it is that was going to make for them the best. It says, this wretched situation was again aggravated or worsened by the galling irritation of the chains, now become insupportable, unbearable, and the filth of the necessary tubs, makeshift toilets, and we read about that, into which the children often fell and were almost suffocated. Now that is disgusting. He's saying the children fell into these porta potties. It says, the shrieks of the woman and the groans of the dying rendered the whole a scene of horror almost inconceivable. So when I said, we're going to read a little bit about growing up in slavery, and he's telling you about the rated, I told you, it's past rated X scene that he's witnessing as an 11-year-old child. Um, the stain that it leaves on his mind, the wound that it inflicts in his soul. Yeah. Childhood Awareness Month. Happily, perhaps for myself, I was soon reduced so low here that it was thought necessary to keep me almost always on deck. And from my extreme youth, I was put not put in feathers. In this situation, I expected every hour to share the fate of my companions, some of whom were almost daily brought upon deck at the point of death, which I began to hope would soon put an end to, he wanted, he said he hoped they'd soon put an end to his misery. Often did I think many of the inhabitants of the deep much more happy than myself. I envied them for the freedom they enjoyed and, and often wish I could change my condition for theirs. The wishing that you can die. This is something that we is repeated. And like I said, they, they would envy those who have already died. I mean, that, is, that condition is unimaginable, even if he's explaining it right now, actually living it and thinking that it was better and it's to die than to endure this. That's a deep space and time. Every circumstances I met served only to render my state more painful and heighten my apprehensions of my opinion of the cruelty of whites. One day they had taken a number of fishes and when they had killed and satisfied themselves with as many as they thought fit to our astonishment who were on the deck, rather than giving any of them to us to eat as we expected, they tossed the remaining fish into the sea again. Although we begged and prayed for some as well as we could, but in vain, and some of my countrymen being pressed by hunger, took an opportunity 
when they thought no one saw them of trying to get a little privately, but they were discovered and the attempt procured them some very severe floggings. One day when we had a smooth sea and moderate wind, two of my weary countrymen who were chained together, I was near them at the time, preferring death to such a life of misery, somehow made through the netting and jumped into the sea. And they have a little picture here. If you can see the picture of the scene of the man with the fish, it's a sketch drawing. And you see the children here standing in horror um, as they're witnessing and processing in their child mind this situation. So um, it says, immediately after another quite dejected fellow who on account of his illness was suffered to be out of irons, also followed their example. And I believe my, many more. So three, he saw three people take themselves out. Recently, not recently, a couple of years ago, they had the whole thing in the Sandy Hook situation where they're saying that all of these children are witness. And when they say children are witness, children need counseling, or people need counseling, adults, how much more so children. Um, so he's sitting there recounting for us in his autobiography, or this portion anyway, that he preferred it. And not only did he prefer to be taken out, he saw people doing it. How does that affect the mind? It says, um, and I believe many more would very soon have done the same if they had not been prevented by the ship's crew who was insane in instant, instantly alarmed. Those of us that were the most active were in a moment put under the deck and there was such a noise and confusion amongst the people of the ship as I never heard before to stop her and get the boat out to go after the slaves. However, two of the wretches were drowned, but they got the other and afterwards flogged him unmercifully for thus attempting to prefer death to slavery. So they said, like, stop the ship, try to get the other two, oh, they're out, get him, bring him back and beat him because he preferred death to slavery. In this manner, we continue to undergo more hardships than I can now relate. Hardships which are inseparable from this accused uh, a trade. Many a time we were near suffocation from the want of fresh air, which we were often without for whole days together. This and the stench of the necessary tubs carried off many. Again, that's the porta pot. During our passage, I first saw flying fishes, which surprised me very much. They used frequent to fly across the ship. Many of them fell on the deck. I also now first saw the use of quadrant, a, a navigational measuring device. And, and, and um, flying fish are actually, I think, Barbados national dish. So in the Caribbean waters around Barbados, Barbados is known for these flying fish that jump out the water. So he's saying these things were jumping out the water and landing on the deck. Um, he says, uh, oh, it's flying fish. He says, I had often with astonishment seen the mariners make observations with it, and I could not think what it meant. They at, le at last took notice of my surprise, and one of them willing to increase it, as well as gratify my curiosity, made me one day look through it. The clouds appeared to me to be land, which disappeared as they passed along. The height, this heightened my wonder, and I was now more persuaded than ever that I was in another world, and that everything about me was magic. So again, oftentimes when you come from different places, uh, spaces within Africa and in different places that we can't explain phenomena, oftentimes we think it's magic, it's beyond this world. So he's in his 11 year old mind, he's like, yo, this ship is magic. You know, this is magic. That's magic. This is how he's rationalizing his experience. He says, arrive at Barbados. See, I knew he had to be seeing some Barbados. I don't really hear about it else, but Barbados, a lot of flying fishes around there arrives at the island at Barbados where the cargo is sold and dispersed. At last, because Barbados was a big, uh, what the first stop oftentimes of English trade, the English trade, Barbados, because they were grabbing up islands, the, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and, and the English, they're grabbing up islands, you know, oh, this is mine, this is mine, they're playing, this is mine, this is mine. Although there were Tahino, I think, Indians and Arawak Indians who were living in these places, but never mind that, this is mine. And Barbados was one that came under, if I'm not mistaken, English occupation. 
At last, we came in sight of the islands of Barbados at which the whites on board gave a great shout and made many signs of joy to us. We did not know what to think of this, but as the vessel drew nearer, we plainly saw the harbor and other ships of different kinds and sea sizes, and we soon anchored amongst them of Bridgetown. And that's the capital, I think. I think that's the capital now, if I'm not mistaken. Many merchants and planters now came aboard. Though it was in the evening, they put in separate parcels or groups and examined us attentively. They also made us jump and point to the land, signifying we were to go there. We thought by this we would should be eaten by these ugly men as they appeared to us. And when soon after we were all put down under the deck again, there was much dread and trembling among us and nothing but bitter cries to be heard all the night from these apprehensions. In so much that at last the white people got so, some old slaves from the land to pacify us. They told us we were not to be eaten, but to work. And we were soon to go on land where we should see many of our countrymen. This report eased us much. And sure enough, soon after we were landed, there came to us Africans of all languages. Again, representing different people. Let me see here. Okay, we're gonna finish our Equiano today because it's like two more pages. But I just wanted to say, okay, you were traumatized, bomb. You know, you were stolen from your family. He's traumatized. His sister's taken from him. They split up. He's on the ship. It's a it's an arduous journey. It's ridiculously crazy. When you land, you really don't get no help. Now it's time to go to work. Imagine you were on your way to work. You know what I'm saying? And something, something of that, this crazy things happened. The person was kidnapped. The person that this happened, that, that happened, tire blew out. You was abused, this, that, and that. And then you arrive someplace of people you don't know, you don't know the language. And then the person says, now get to work. At what point did you have time to process any of this? You can't say, you know what? I think I need a two week vacation. You know, I had a little hard time. Let me take some time to get. So understand that before and after the arrival there was never a space in time that you were not working and never a space in time where you really could heal so what we it's the compression right now in this space that we are all, all throughout the islands this is why we have weird behavior i'm just gonna say what it is we have some really crazy weird behavior i'll talk about that after i'm done let me finish reading before i go of course we were conducted immediately to the merchant's yard where we were all pent up together like so many sheep in a fold without regard to sex or age. As every object was new to me, everything I saw filled me with surprise. What struck me first was that the houses were built with stories and in every other aspect different from those in Africa. But I was still more astonished of pe seeing people on horseback. I did not know what this could mean. And indeed I thought these people were full of nothing but magical arts. While I was in this astonishment, one of my fellow prisoners spoke to a countryman of his about the horses who said they were the same kind they had in their country. I understood them, though they were from a distant part of Africa, and I thought it odd I had not seen any horses there. But afterwards, when I came to converse with different Africans, I found they had many horses amongst them and much larger than those I then saw. We were not so he's making this distinction. I just keep saying he's making the distinction because there was definitely a distinction in their understanding. We were not many days in the merchant's custody before we were sold after their usual manner, which is this. On a signal given as the beat of a drum, the buyers rush at once in the yard where the slaves are confined and make the choice of that parcel they like best. And remember we read before and the man before, I think it was Falconbridge, Alexander, he said it, they called that a scramble, where they just hold them off and they and, and they they just want to get rid of sick, dying, all kind of slaves, and they made it kind of like Black Friday on your behind, and they open the door and everybody runs in to try to uh, procure help. Right? The noise and clamor with which this is attended and the eagerness visible in the countenances of the buyers serve not a little to increase the apprehension of the terrified Africans who may well be supposed to consider them as the ministers of that destruction to which they think themselves devoted. In this manner, without scruple or relations and French friends separated, most of them never to see each other again. Separation anxiety. I remember in the vessel in which I was brought over in the men's apartment, there were several brothers who in the scale or in the cell were sold in different lots. 
And it was very moving on this occasion to see and hear their cries at parting. It's like somebody just, you know, you bang your toe or you might hit your toe, stub your toe on something. And then you go and you stub your toe again and you just keep hitting that same spot over and over, over again. Yeah. The author is carried to Virginia. It says, I totally lost the small remains of comfort I enjoyed in conversing with my countrymen. The women too, who used to wash and take care of me were all gone different ways. And I never saw one of them afterwards. I stayed in this island for a few days. I believe it could not be above a fortnight or two weeks when I and some few more slaves that were not saleable amongst the rest from very much fretting were shipped off to a sloop for North America. Another practice. People don't like when you say it, but it's the truth. According to what we're reading, the majority of the slaves were not taken to America. The majority was taken to the Caribbean and South America. South America being the most, Caribbean being the second, and some of the largest places is like Jamaica, Cuba, these places. Um, Barbados is another one with a considerable number of slaves. And like he said, when they when they had certain refuse, they would send it to the Americas. So America got the least amount of slaves, but at the same time, America instituted one of the harshest um, memories of slavery because in the Caribbean, oftentimes you were able to hold on sometimes to a little bit of remnant of who you were. But America, the American slave master being outnumbered crazy, um, wanted to kind of erase that. So it took it to another level. But anywho, he says, uh, he says, uh, he said, on the passage, we were better treated than when we were coming from Africa. And we have plenty of rice and fat pork. There we go with the feeding of the unclean food. We were landed up a river a good way from the sea about Virginia country, where we saw few or none of other native Africans and not one soul who could talk to me. I was a few weeks weeding grass and gathering stones in a plantation. And at last my companions were distributed different ways and only myself was left. I was now exceedingly miserable and thought myself worse off than any of the rest of my companions for they could talk to each other but I had no person to speak to that I could understand. In this state, I was constantly grieving and pining, wishing that he would die rather than anything else. While I was in the plantation, a gentleman to who I suppose the estate belonged, being unwell, I was one day sent for to his dwelling house to fan him. So you were the air conditioned. When I came into the room where he was, I was very much frightened at some things I saw, and the more so, I had seen a black woman slave as I came through the house who was cooking the dinner and the poor creature was cruelly loaded with various kinds of iron machines. She had one particularly on her head, which locked her mouth so fast that she could scarcely speak and could not eat nor drink. So one of the mass things that we see oftentimes pictured, he's saying he saw a woman like this. I was such much astonished and shocked at this contri contrivance which I afterward learned was called the iron muzzle. Soon after I had a fan put in my hand to fan the gentleman while he slept. And so I did indeed with great fear. While he was fast asleep, I indulged myself a great deal in looking around the room, which to me appeared very fine and curious. The first object that engaged my attention was a watch which hung on the chimney and was going. I was quite surprised at the noise it made and was afraid it would tell the gentleman anything I, I might do amiss. And when I immediately after observed a picture hanging in the room, which appeared constantly to look at me, I was still more afraid. So he's like, he think the watch is a camera. He, you know, the picture is moving around a little boy, you know, um, I was still more frightened after never seeing such things as these before. At one time, I thought it was something relative to magic and not seeing it move. I thought it might be some way the whites had to keep their great men when they died and offer them libations as we used to do to our friendly spirit. So now he's bringing in his African spirituality and the things that they used to do um, in Africa, offering libations and, and magic. So he keeps saying magic because they would have been aware of magic because this is something that they did culturally. In this state of anxiety, I remained till my master awoke when I was dismissed out of the room to my no small satisfaction and relief. 
for I thought that these people were all made up of wonders. Lastly, he says, very soon afterwards, Equiano, oh, that's it. And this is this is the, the author's note. Very soon afterwards, Equiano was purchased by a British lieutenant in the Royal Navy, was named Gustavus Vasas, much against his will, and was taken to England. He was almost 12 years old. So all of this has happened when he's a baby, a young man, still a baby, 11, 12, and was taken to England and he was almost 12. He spent the rest of his adolescent years traveling around the world with his new master. At the age of 18, he was sold to the West Indies where he slaved for three years, often aboard ships. At this time, he was earning money to be by various means and eventually was able to purchase his freedom. For many years thereafter, his life was a series of surprise and unusual adventures, many on the high seas in almost every part of the world. He even went on an explanatory voyage to the North Pole. In 1777, at the age of 32, he retired from seafaring life and spent the rest of his life primarily in London. There he worked as a servant to a number of high-ranking gentlemen and even petitioned the queen on behalf of his fellow Africans suffering as slaves in the West Indies. He died a wealthy and relatively famous man. And again, I do have the book. We have Most High Blessed and Willing all year. You know, once we finish up some of these other books. So that's his childhood portion of his book. And we're reading out of Growing Up in Slavery. We're, we're acknowledging um, Child Abuse Awareness Month and really giving an opportunity to have this conversation. Please don't ask me, Amuna, how many books you're reading. Some of these books I've already read and I'm just sharing with you. And some of them I haven't read. And so I'm just interested, you know, Lev Project, just to keep it interesting and going. Let me make sure we don't have any questions before I... Uh, Angel says thank you. I want to thank you, Angel. Angel has been supporting since day one, the Lev Project, always coming through, always sharing her thoughts. You know, it's people like Angel who makes me to understand that this conversation is not in vain. And if one person is touched by this, I say, oh, praise be to the most side, because we can we can help one another heal. And we don't know who is who amongst us and who is waiting for this word or waiting to be helped in this direction. So I want to thank Angel. I want to thank everybody who's tuning into the Left Project, who's, you know, quiet and who's vocal. Hopefully you'll come out and have the conversation, be willing, you know, I can bring you in and you can have the conversation on the other side of the screen. And um, it's a beautiful thing. So I had to get that in today. I wanna thank you for taking your time and joining us. And um, I pray everybody have a blessed evening. This evening I have something to do, so I won't be able to read this evening, but prayerfully I'll be able to read tomorrow on 30 Years a Slave. So until next time, Go and be the change that you want to see in the world. One.